So, wakey, wakey, hands off, snakey. <laughs> yes. Is that something you say over here? Um, no, but I, I'm pretty sure I know what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, I think I got it from my South African friend in New Zealand, because I think that's what his mum would tell him. It was she, a voice in the dark, like us, saying, <laughs> wakey, wakey, hands off, snakey. Oh, it's creepy if it's coming to you in the dark, I think. That's right. We are voices in the dark. I am John. Ooh. I'm Dre. We are learning how to human. And yes, and part of that is learning how to deal with internet trolls today. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, I'm glad that I haven't read the comments on um, <laughs> our most successful video to date, which is approaching like 10,000 views, um, where we talked about Jordan Peterson and the controversy that emerged over his interview on Channel 4 um, about gender pronouns, about the pay gap, about self-development, about the so-called crisis of masculinity. Yeah. So go check that out. Um, we'll check the interview with Jordan and... Uh, Kathy Newman. Mm -hmm. There's uh, a link that we put in our in our show notes. It's also on the podcast feed. If yeah. you look back a few episodes, you'll see it. And check our response to it, which is what people are going crazy over. Yes. And it's weird. We thought we might run the risk of offending the supposed liberal leftist evil <laughs> <laughs> people that uh, Jordan Peterson's fans are always on the lookout for. Mm-hmm. Uh, turns out we upset Jordan Peterson fans, even though we largely agree with him. Yes, I think it's 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 a problem that emerges just because we were mildly critical of him, or we we're like we think there's a, a a bunch of good messages in here, but we don't agree with these points, and we think that he could convey it better to, in, in various ways, to convince the people that he's trying to convince. But they mm. didn't hear that. What they heard instead was, "You're critical of my Messiah." Yeah, which good. Went a long way to proving the <laughs> the supposed liberal leftists that are oppressing them right in their oppression of them, in my <laughs> view. I mean, it's weird. Like, I don't get I don't get the aggression. I don't think I didn't think we criticized him in our video almost at all, really. And I mean, even if we did, I mean, I don't know. I don't. I just don't get it. I don't get the hullabaloo. Well, I mean, I, I, I get it, but I don't think that it's uh, that the, the, the criticisms and abuse being thrown our way are really based on what we said. You know, this is just the classic problem that, say, Peterson faces, other people face, that once you start talking about things that people are very sensitive about, they don't necessarily listen to what you say. They just wait for some trigger words, mm. like the interviewer Kathy Newman did to him. Like, she ignored almost everything that he said and just jumped on certain points and said so what you're saying is yeah he's like no I, I didn't i didn't say that yeah anyway uh i'm i'm following the advice of uh various people who have uh generally said yeah if, if people are commenting on your youtube videos don't read them <laughs> uh, it's a slippery slope you have to take it as an amusement mostly yeah, I, I find that a bit challenging, and I, I, I didn't didn't wake up the best refreshed this morning, so I thought I don't need to begin by drinking toxic waste. No, who needs that? So you can go check that out, everyone. Go and go and fight our side, or or whatever you. Or I won't know what tell you do. Tell us that we're. What, what was it? What was the uh, intellectual midgets? Intellectual midgets, or or one of my favorites. We're cucks. We're cucks, and clearly have low testosterone. Oh, clearly, yeah. Clearly. And uh, shut up, you bitch. How dare you? He's done it all and more. You're a poopy pants. That's my favorite, I think. <laughs> Is that a real one? Yeah. That, I thought that was a joke one that you told me. No. <laughs> He's done it all and more and you're a poopy <laughs> pants. Yeah. <I> think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that has actually brightened my day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how, how peculiar. Well, it'd be really fun to meet Jordan Peterson one day and kind ask of... Him. And talk... Are you a poopy pants? Have you done it all? Um and you know talk about the experience of this because I'm, I'm sure he's faced very much worse from the people who dislike him mm. so and I, I quite like him okay I mean there's there's the funny irony at the center of this and I think you I think you're right mate more or less anyway let's talk about Seneca which tends to raise a little less controversy <laughs> yeah and views though like, yeah, <laughs> clearly hating us is a far greater pleasure for people than agreeing with us. It's an easier route to take, after sure. all. Um, and this letter is number twenty-five, called "On Reformation," which is quite a good title. I'll probably still change it um, for our episode. And 
Yeah. Sorry, go on. This one is about how and when to help other people, whether we can really get anyone to change after a certain age, how to check also when we're not in need of correction or if we are, and uh, whether we should calibrate that by looking at everyone else or turning instead to our inner compass. Um, in all of these things, the key point seems to me to be about timing and hard work. I like this one. It's quite short, but um, we had some had some issues, <laughs> did yeah, we not, with the language? We did. Uh, once again, I started reading, and I was ready to throw my toys out of the pram mm -hmm. um, as my mind was trying to decide whether I had reached a stage of dementia that no longer <laughs> allowed me to read complex <laughs> language or if it was really badly written. Um, and, and I've decided I came, it's really badly written. <laughs> I think it's the, the version we're working off, which is the same as in the Tim Ferriss audiobook, is an old translation which is freely available on Wikisource. So you can read along and there's always a link in the notes for each episode. Um, but it's kind of like Victorian style English. So it is quite challenging compared to the, the way things are written today. But I came up with the perfect solution. Yeah, you did. That was very handy. You pointed me to the far superior Italian translation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which just made sense. It just makes sense. It just works. Because I thought, well... Uh, I assume that the Italian will be closer to the original Latin in terms of like the syntax, for example, yeah. meaning that it's an, a more easy and fluid transition. Well, what I realized is that the English translation, essentially, probably because the Victorian people thought very highly of English, tries to maintain the Latin syntax. Oh, okay. I think. It tries to maintain a non-Germanic -German, like non syntax, syntax and structural thought in a Germanic language, hmm. which my mind couldn't compute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, bef before we get into it, I, I want to pleasure the um, head orifices of our, well, I guess two of them, of our listeners, um, by getting you to read the first line in Italian. Oh, oh, okay. Because uh, uh, I think it sounds so pretty. <laughs> Riguardo ai nostri due amici, bisogna seguire una strada diversa. Correggere i vizi dell'uno, stroncare quelli dell'altro. Sarò molto franco. Non gli vorrei bene se non lo trattassi con asprezza. Oh, I think we can all just have a nice little sit down now <laughs> and enjoy it. I love the, I love the, the R's in, in Italian, the sort of rolling R's. Hmm. Yeah, be careful. You might need to lock your bedroom door tonight after Goodness. that. <laughs> Um, so before we get into the letter in boring old English, um, until, you know, people go back through our archives and translate everything for the greater good, um, so it's available to everybody, um, please, if you like what we're doing, if you want to support us to continue doing this, uh, tell a friend, uh, if you can give us an iTunes five-star review, uh, rating, review, whatever, that will make us feel awesome and will give the show greater profile, allow us to get more guests on and all that good stuff. Hit us up and talk to us on the socials, um, facebook.com slash V in the D. Instagram is at V in the D dot pod, which is kind of fun. Enjoying playing with that now in an unexpected twist after I hated Instagram. <laughs> But as soon as I started taking off my clothes on Instagram, suddenly Everything I'm very popular. Right. Mm. That's not on the V and the D feed, though. You'll, be, mm -hmm. you'll have to find me independently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a uh, big shout out, as always, to our Patreon supporters, the people who don't think that we're intellectual midgets and poopy pants. Maybe they do. Maybe that's why they subscribe. <laughs> Maybe they find it funny to watch us dance, <laughs> dance and fall. Um, there yes. is one there is one comment that like now I'm very self conscious about. Uh oh. Some guy was like, dude, stop breathing so hard into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm gonna you're probably gonna see on YouTube that I'm gonna breathe off mic. <laughs> okay. And we are now on, on, on YouTube where all hell breaks loose apparently. Uh so uh, I have to try and keep remembering that there's a camera wa watching us, so you know, I try not to just act like a total ape and just scratch myself <laughs> all times. Uh, thanks to the Patreon community. We love you very much. If you can spare just a little bit of money um, each month, you can sign up over there and get access to the extra content. Talk to us directly. Um, we prioritize the people who invest in us. And it's I love the messages we get on Patreon. Yeah. Our most engaged. Oh, we got another wonderful message from, I think... Jan. Yeah. Is it... 
you know, when, if there's, if there's such a thing as your your true one thousand, what is it? How does it? A thousand true fans. A thousand true fans. The thing. He's he's, a, he's one of them. Yeah, he's. A, <laughs> is he number one? <laughs> Certainly feels like he's the first one to f- put that level of engagement. I mean, no one's ever written such long messages to us repeatedly. So mm. thank you, Jan. Yeah, and not not just like long, but. Like, oh my God, you're remembering callbacks to things that yeah. we said like half Quoting a year ago. jokes and oh, it, it's, it really touched my heart to see that. <sighs> so thank you. Thank you to everybody who supports the show. Um, and now to Seneca and his difficult syntax. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this one begins with him apparently responding to Lachilius uh, over an issue of mutual friends that they have. And there's two of these friends who seem to be having issues that need correction. And Seneca prescribes two different approaches. Um, He says, the faults of the one are to be corrected, the others are to be crushed out. Mm. Total annihilation. I bought a blender recently, which is uh, called the Ninja Blender, and it has included total crushing blades. Wow. That's what they call them. It's the most masculine thing I own. <laughs> a blender. A blender. Okay. For making smoothies. <laughs> so masculine. So why the total crushing blades? Um, so first of all, this is the context is everything that one approach is not going to work on everyone, for yourself, with other people, whatever. The first one Seneca wants to take uh, the hard line with. And he says, I shall take every liberty, for I do not love this one, this person, if I'm unwilling to hurt his feelings. So you, it's kind of rough love situation. It? Yeah. So if I translate from Italian to English. Oh, this is going to be a running thing now, isn't it? <laughs> oh, just, 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 just to give you a, a hint. So what he says is, let me be frank. I wouldn't care for him if I didn't treat him harshly. That seems clearer. I guess I'm trying to sort of translate English to English when I'm like <laughs> quoting and saying, I guess it means this. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, Lucilius in Seneca's like reading is saying, probably you're going to object. It's like, do you expect to keep a 40 year old ward under your tutelage? Consider his age, how hardened it now is and past handling. Such a man cannot be reshaped. Only young minds are molded. So Seneca's saying otherwise that it's not a case that people can't change after a certain age and that it isn't futile to try and make some of those changes. And he's prepared to hurt this guy's feelings and shatter his current reality in the process. Whereas Lucilius is potentially saying it's a lost cause. Don't even bother. And I, I wonder if you would agree with that. Is it a lost cause? What is your desired outcome? To quote, well... To quote myself, but <laughs> now, now it's going to seem like I'm quoting Jordan Peterson because he also uses that. It's like, mm-hmm. what, what are you trying to achieve? What you're trying to achieve is somewhat make a poor bastard's life slightly better continuously. Mm-hmm. Then sure, keep doing it. If you're hoping for permanent change and relief and success and feeling like you've accomplished lasting um, sort of transformation, maybe you're, it's a fool's errand. Hmm. So is it about them or about you? Yeah. It's about, is it about them or is it about you? And specifically, like, are you, are you okay doing this forever? Because it probably will keep going back and forth and there'll be hmm. con- like a continuous sort of feeling of, am I actually doing any, anything good here? Hmm. If you're happy to take that on because you really care about the person, it's a difficult thing to do, but maybe not a bad one. Yeah. I think that's what, what Seneca says next, that he's saying it's not... This was the, the, the sentence that was doing your head in. Um, so my, my paraphrase would be, don't, don't just give up because it's much better to, well, I guess determine in yourself whether or not you would rather try and fail or just not try at all. And if you're going to try, try all the way, it says hold out against excess and force and force them to do and submit to many things against their will. You might need to do that or yeah. otherwise don't bother. Go all in balls deep. I'm trying to find the same paragraph. Uh, nope. Lost it. Well, you can look for it whilst I babble. Um, 
And so this is about forcible helping based on the idea of it's better to try and fail than not to try at all. Um, I suppose that's true, but I think what, what you just said is really interesting that it does make a difference for ourselves if we're trying to look at what our actual objective is. If we want to feel good about ourselves purely to go, well, I tried, well done me, pat myself on the shoulder, um, that's maybe not the best motivation to do things. I think that has to be in, to be healthy to be a fringe benefit. All right. And you have to stop thinking about it in a way like... Um it's a very modern way to look at things in many ways, this whole, like the idea of completing a task. Mm -hmm. If you think about it more like you're maintaining a vintage car, which will continuously break down, it will require a lot of hard work, some of the parts are hard to obtain, mm -hmm. you might have to do a lot of the mechanical work yourself, but there's a beauty mm. in what you're trying to preserve and maintain and allow to continue to exist in a time that maybe it's no longer adapted for. Hmm. It's a good metaphor. Hmm. Points to you. Because <laughs> 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 we constantly got a scoreboard going on the YouTube video, racking up points. Do we have like a, a, like a little meter in the bottom it says cuck and at the top it says not a cuck. And if we get, <laughs> if we get high enough, then maybe we'll re-earn the respect of those Jordan Peters Peterson <laughs> rabbit fans. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. And then we can wear t-shirts. Uh, with not a cuck written on them. <laughs> Such a strange, strange community. Look how it's haunting us. <laughs> I'm just thinking about some of the weirdest bits. Like, it's like, oh, look at you, Max. I'm like, I'm Max? sorry. Do you find that offensive? Oh, Max. Yeah, that was we... one of the comments. Oh, we, we Apparently, have... because we are using our laptops to read our notes. Mm. I guess we were doing some sort of display of ostentation i don't know is, is it a thing <laughs> i don't know i couldn't understand i did i did try to reply to him but he hasn't replied back okay well you you're engaging with him what is your overall objective i suppose in that thing because i sort of feel like uh you know david attenborough exploring the mm -hmm. savannah and looking at curious little animals doing strange things like what are you <laughs> <laughs> well that di re relates directly to this this question this letter that do you think it's possible to change the minds of people who seem deeply entrenched in their current perspective. Is it worth trying? Is that what you're trying to do? No, not with these people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not particularly concerned whether they change their mind or not. I'd like them to change their mind, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to try particularly hard to do so. Do you think it's it's possible in this if we were to think like? in parallel with the, uh, the, the, the older person of the two that Seneca is talking about here. It is possible. So to intentionally change someone's mind, as opposed to just be from exposure to your stuff and their personal growth, you need direct contact. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to change a random YouTuber person's mind like without being able to sit down and talk to them person to person. I don't think you can mm -hmm. reach someone that way. They might accidentally, like they might be, maybe they watch three or four of your videos and they go, oh, okay. And they mm. change their own mind. That's different. But if you want that, like pulling someone out of one opinion into another, then you need that personal interaction. If you're doing it to help someone out, like Seneca is suggesting, I think it is possible. Different people are at different stages of whether or not that'll be easy. Hmm. Um, people only change when they want to change. And there's very few things that make someone make someone truly desire to be someone different. Even when even people that hate themselves prefer that hatred to potentially a new hatred that they're unfamiliar with. Of. Yeah, the familiar, even if it's like horrible, at least you know it. Yeah. False comfort. So it has to be so uncomfortable to be themselves that they want to escape from it before you can truly make a, a lasting impact that doesn't require constant adjustment mm. and i find that primarily the thing that gets people there most often is grief mm -hmm. so severe disappointment or emotional destruction over a loss of some kind a career a child uh, a wife or husband um whether through death or through because you know they, they made a mistake and the person's left them or because they've been unable to achieve their goals and finally they've got no one left to blame by themselves for whatever reason they realize that they are the reason they're failing hmm. getting to that point gets someone to go shit and then they sort of look 
to whoever can give them some help. Like, what do I do? When someone thinks, what do I do? And they look into your eyes and they say that they're ready to hear it. When they're asking you, it's like, what should I do about this? It's different, but it's that desperate, like, help me, I'm lost. Mm. Then they're receptive to it. Well, there's the whole, you can lead a horse to water saying, you can bring people and show them there's the water, but they're going to have to want to drink it. Yeah. You can also chip away slowly at things and allow people to make their own opinions up about things and slowly lead them down a path. But it's hard to overcome their programming in most cases, I think. And ultimately, it's unpredictable where they will go. I think there's a possible, there's, a, there's also a positive version of this where when you see people who are living a life which is inspiring where you see an example that you're like oh that that looks good and it sort of awakens a desire within you that in a way is still addressing the fact that there's a shit my life isn't where i want it to be but it isn't such a grief-filled intense confrontation with that so much as a oh maybe i'll go and have a look at this maybe i'll start kind of doing this and i think that that's an easier transition um because you don't have to say Oh, because I'm kind of excited by some exercise class I saw that someone that I know and respect is doing. I'm going to check it out. I wasn't forced. I didn't have. I don't have to then turn around and confront the fact that I hate my body. Hmm. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll give that a go. And there's other things you can do also to shift balance. I think if you think of having a conversation or an argument or a long-standing relationship where you're trying to affect someone's life and opinions as like a judo match mm -hmm. you know, someone's squared off perfectly like ready like in fighting stance you're gonna have a hard time sort of pushing him like around it's all about you know getting them off balance so then you can do your move mm -hmm. and by sort of running pushing pulling moving side to side until the feet are slightly apart in the wrong way and suddenly just a little twist and their own weight works against them so there are life versions of that in different ways. Uh, if someone hasn't traveled before, mm. getting them to travel or traveling with them can have a profound effect in their opening of their mind. Mm. Um, coming to care for someone more than they care about themselves is another powerful one. It changes perspective. It changes because it flips the switch on sort of a very egocentric framework of analysis that maybe they have never been set outside of. I find that one really uh, powerful that I've found even in moments of uh, deepest depression. As soon as someone I care about needs my care and help, suddenly I feel like basically great and fine because I have a thing that is meaningful for me to do that I want to do and can do. Now I'm like, okay, never mind. Let's talk about your stuff. Mm. And it's like the weight just kind of slides away. So the answer is I need to surround myself with damaged people who yeah. <laughs> need my help and I will feel great. <laughs> sure. That, that's the lesson there. That's the lesson. But yeah, the, the, there are tools at your disposal if you are a mentor to essentially lead the horse to water and at least dunk the head in <laughs> as close as you can. Well, actually, no, trip it up so it essentially goes in and maybe with its tongue out goes, oh, this is tasty. I should drink. Nom, 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 yeah. nom. Um, the other person that, that uh, Seneca is discussing here is someone who is younger and uh, what he has to say kind of links with what, part of what we were just talking about. He's, not, uh, he's also not hopeful about the young one, but says, at least this guy still feels some shame for whatever it is he's doing. We're not sure what it is he's doing or doing wrong. But Seneca's message is if there's shame, then there's still hope for change. So if it's not exactly grief, but... And still a shred of self-awareness to feel like this isn't right, what I'm doing. I'm beginning to be confronted with the fact that I don't feel good about the situation and my actions. You're looking very skeptical. I'm just thinking about that. I think shame is a danger because he also says that you like encourage and foster that shame. <laughs> well, he, t he says encourage and foster modesty. Okay. But it is in the context of talking about that shame is like the expression of going, whoa, I've kind of overstepped myself and seem silly and embarrassed right now. I think shame is a dangerous emotion to encourage. 
Yeah, I made a similar point because it can backfire enormously that if you force someone into a position of, of shame, it can just provoke anger, resentment, and an absolute refusal to change. I'm thinking of Cersei Lannister here. Shame. Shame. Ding, ding. But it's, it's also, it's a weird almost fight or flight response mm -hmm. like against shame uh, people become unpredictable mm -hmm. it is such an uncomfortable feeling more than pain for a lot of people that the first solution to relieve them of it that presents itself will be the one taken mm -hmm. and you have very little control over what their brain will decide is that thing is it could just be run away it could be violence it could be a psychotic break where you just ref you like create a new reality away from this one where you feel so bad yeah so basically that so that way be dragons mm. yeah literally the <laughs> game of thrones scenario um so i don't think it's a good idea to try and foster shame in that way but i think in a more careful way it's possible to steer someone's attention towards their better nature perhaps so mm. i thought of a, a kind of i guess a bit off the wall idea that came to mind i was thinking of this ca um, case in early soviet history where as various uh, young activists went out to try and collectivize um, agriculture basically forcibly say everybody has to work together and we're going to do it in concentrated locations so give up your your farm and any income of your own all collective blah 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 and one of the the more successful at least for a time um tactics that uh the local people in the villages had was to wheel out the mothers and grandmothers to just effectively shame these young activists with the kind of moral authority of your mum just going, what are you doing? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? What about all of these values that you've grown up with, even if you've taken on some new ones now and are heading in a different direction? And it was surprisingly effective. That's, I can just sort of picture it as this sort of, I, I come in and I've got lots of ideas and I'm 19 years old and I know how everything is meant to be. And then a, a grandmother is like, aren't you ashamed of yourself, young man, acting like this? Look at the harm you're doing. Look how you're and him just beginning to go bright red and going, I, um, um, what are you going to do? Are you going to hit me? I'm an old lady. Uh. I think that tactic would not have worked for the Germans. <laughs> the Germans? I'm just imagining a cold SS officer going. Yeah, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't, it didn't work in the long term in the Soviet Union either. Yeah. It was just the image that came to mind of the idea of if someone is kind of arrogantly perhaps pursuing something which you're like, well, you're going in a bad direction and you're hurting other people here or you're hurting yourself. How can I try and bring you back? And that can be do I guess something to do with shame, but I guess it's more sort of rueful regret or recognition if you can try and get them to tune into their better nature, remind them of some positive experience or act that they did in the past. I mean, even in like conversations, like difficult conversations you can have with people, it really helps if you can go, yeah, but it's like that time when and look back at something like when you said that thing and we both realized that actually it, it had this negative effect or when you said that thing but it was at, at the wrong time and it caused this cascading things and you're like oh i do because it's a little touchstone of orientation for when you've maybe made a kind of similar misjudgment that can at the emo give that kind of emotional understanding rather than simply going this is against your better nature because i'm telling you so did that make sense i think so Okay. I was like trying to search for a more concrete example, but it's kind of hard when the, the, the letter itself is kind of talking in, in generalities. It's interesting that he doesn't give the example. Mm. It makes me feel these people are real. He didn't want to yeah. shame them. Shame. <laughs> Too much. Um, what was I going to say? Some of it towards the end, to me, felt like he was essentially trying to establish... Uh, a pre-Christian version of self-flagellation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This weird kind of, I don't know, it had the vibes of the kind of look at look at yourself and uh, like sort of feel disgusted by that, you know, man, <laughs> cool, but kind of a, no? Um, Is it just my reading of it? I didn't feel it was so harsh. 
Now you've got command of the Italian text. Now you. Yeah, but it's really. It's, someone wrote it in. Well, they didn't write. It. I guess they 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 posted it on this website. I think it's seven point text. Or something <laughs> ridiculous. So I'm having trouble reading it from this distance. You do have a zoom function available to you. But then I have to scroll across the paragraph because it's also super wide. Okay. I mean, these are difficult times. Yes. First world problem. But. Uh, also, now you've decided to have access to the text more directly in front of you, you're breaking my beautifully structured notes. <laughs> <laughs> this is, we're not at the end of the letter yet. Sorry, sorry. But, uh, yeah, no, I can't, I can't follow. It's too small. Yeah, that's, that's like, what, I'm she, that's what she said. Um, so, for the older guy, okay. if, if you want to do the episodes differently in future, no, no, we no, can no, do no. them differently in future. Sorry. <laughs> um, for the older guy... Despite what Seneca says at first, he's still like all this tough love. We've got to like put the hammer down on him. He also urges some caution and he, he doesn't believe there's really been a change in this guy despite outward appearances. So it seems like this guy has maybe changed his tune a little bit. Maybe he's settled down, but Seneca is suspicious and is like, yeah, I don't think I trust this. But at the same time, this is the right moment to try and intervene. He says, there's no better time to approach him than now when he has an interval of rest and seems like one who has corrected his faults. Others have been cheated by this interval of virtue on his part, but he does not cheat me. Like, basically, I'm not fooled by this. I feel sure that these faults will return, as it were, with compound interest. For just now, I am certain they are in abeyance, but not absent. I liked this because I think we can all think of occasions where someone claims they've turned over a new leaf or uh, they're a new person now and you're like, I'm just going to wait a bit and see. But at the same time, the fact that they're willing to be making changes is the best time to try and foster and encourage that as opposed to when they revert back and go, oh, I never really believed in that that new diet or new belief system or not being a cunt. <laughs> Those three things. Those three things in particular. <laughs> because the, there is a moment of pause, I think, and that's the best time, like in the lull, the space between the out-breath and the in-breath. And don't try and fix someone and make them confront their problems and misdeeds at the height of their intensity or their anger. Mm -hmm. And this made me think of it in terms of, say, relationships, if there's some argument or disagreement going on, that often the storm really has to pass before anything good can come out of it. That um, if you can give people the space to express what they need to, because it's often an emotional discharge that's necessary in a sense of letting out the pressure, once the pressure is out, then a clearer head returns. Um, sometimes you just need to sort of scream kind of uh or hopefully not scream but potentially scream just some unconnected words vague vaguely expressing your emotional state or something you were unhappy about and once you've got it out you're like uh actually i feel okay i'm sorry i didn't really need to to say that i was just just in a rage i just needed to get it out so to me it sounds like it's kind of a rage or frustration orgasm <laughs> he's just like bang and after he's like oh okay <laughs> now we can chill out a little bit we must also be aware that in most cases for most of us unless we're philip mckernan or someone of that caliber that we are helping people very far downstream from their actual problems whatever issues we think are their issues are just if the effect of the effect of the effect of shit that's happened to them in the past starting all the way from their childhood hmm. and so you're trying to tweak behavior that is very far downstream and very very much ingrained to the point that now there's a good chance that the way that they relate to their relationships is partly based on the way that they're doing um that bad habit that bad habit has informed them because that bad habit was present when they formed the most significant relationships in their life. So it is re-triggered every time they have any kind of relationship and you can't change that right away. You can't, you maybe you don't even not aware. Like a bad, what sort of bad habit? I, I don't know because the example's vague well, I mean, here. Like, can you, can you like imagine one for me to try and keep a hold of what, of what you're saying there? I was trying to do that whilst also trying to construct my <laughs> sentence and I couldn't seem to do both at the same time. Um, 
just trying to think. What 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 could be an example of uh, what Seneca is trying to? And I'll try to relate it to that. If you can think of the example, what well, what is something that could this old bastard could be doing that Seneca's like, oh my god, I, I can't fucking stand him when he does that. <laughs> um, maybe forcibly uh, speaking, like being very critical of people around him, perhaps like making snide remarks. Right. So that could, for example, have become his identity. Mm -hmm. So being critical is not just a behavior, but it's who he is. Because in the past, it validated him, for example, because it was the only way he'd get attention from his dad. Okay. Unmitting that simply by trying to fix the... Yeah, trying to make, stop Sean, making the snide comments. Yeah, yeah. it is going to be really, really difficult. And even okay. if you figure out the original problem, unmitting that out of the experience of interacting with every other human being on Earth for his whole life that way, mm -hmm. it has informed how he learned to love it has informed how he got disappointed in someone for the first time because he was operating from that critical point when that happened everything else in his brain has been constructed with that framework in existence hmm. unknitting that is not just one thing you're pulling at, at a th you're pulling one thread out of a tapestry and trying to find where it's going hmm. there's um have you seen the tony robbins netflix special i am no. not your guru it's pretty American, but uh, it's it's really interesting. There's some powerful moments in it. And if I can remember one of them right, um, there's this, uh, there's a woman who he's addressing from the stage and she's talking about a difficulty with uh, relationships that she, she's been in and the, the current guy who's sweetness and light, but she doesn't like it really because it's kind of too easy. I'm a strong woman and I want to be challenged. And I want him to be a man and this sort of stuff. And he rapidly goes to asking about her father. I mean, this is what he's really good at is just kind of going, okay, I see where this goes in the tapestry. I'm going to go and check the other end of this thread. And she said he was the most amazing man in the world. It's like, wow. oh, okay, interesting. Um, and he asked, so he just, you know, he made you feel the best. You were his little princess, right? And she was like, yeah, yeah, I was. He was wonderful. And he goes, that motherfucker. And she's like, oh, what the fuck did you, what did you say about daddy? <laughs> and he uses this language to kind of abruptly break that down and go, he, I'm sure he did it all with the best of intentions and out of a great love for you, but he fucked you up because you went through the rest of your life never thinking that you had to do anything to be loved or to earn love, that anything that you did, you would never have to correct your behavior because everything would always be forgiven, no questions asked, because you are a princess and you are perfect. And I, I guess there's, there's many virtues to believing you're inherently enough, but I think it goes too far into thinking whatever you want is the most important thing and love is not a reciprocal relationship but is something that you are given and you don't need to care about what you do and how you express it and whether you give it to other people that's a good example yeah i, I do recommend watching that it's a kind of slightly surreal yeah, experience but there's some he powerful moments a little bit. Well, he's, he's a, <laughs> a giant extremely perceptive man I mean, <laughs> but the funny thing is he's not that giant I mean, mm -hmm. he's tall, but he's not that tall. I've seen him next to someone who's naturally that tall as opposed to having a gigantism condition that was stopped. Okay. He has a very and large he head. Like, yeah, that's the thing. He's got that huge... He looks like he should be eight feet, but I think mm. he's only 6'4 or something like that. Sorry, Tony, you're not as tall as people think you are. <laughs> I don't know. It just freaked me out a little bit. I mean, sweet man, but also a bit weird. But I'll check it out. Yeah, we go have a look. It's quite... It gave me the feels a few times. Oh. Hmm. Although there's so many moments where it's like he, he does the, it, what they call interventions, which is that like with one person in the crowd, something has to happen right now. I think there are hundreds of other people in this room. Like you just saved this one guy from suicide. How many are going to leave this room and just top themselves because you didn't pick them? I don't know. Um, yeah, that responsibility. So much responsibility. Maybe because goes to his head, who should I save tonight? Who is worthy? And then it will go too far, like in the opposite direction. And he just starts pressing like Dr. Evil buttons on his chair going, you don't make it into the pit. The, the, my counteracting of that is that people like him or like Philip McCurden can identify the problem and can go quite a long ways to helping trying to unknit that. But I question whether that's effective long term. I don't know if people 
truly change. In most cases, I believe they don't. And I think all it does is lay down like a wound bear <laughs> for them mm -hmm. to be aware of. But ultimately, they seem to just continue to do the same things. I've met so many people that have been healed by gurus or been awakened by an enlightened experience. And you're talking to them. You're like, you're doing the same thing, but in a different way. I think that's an example of spiritual bypassing where you bypass the actual work and healing by just taking on the latest fad and language and say that, of course, I've done all this, this healing and it revealed the wound and identified my problem was that um, I saw my father as a god and so on. But then you didn't actually change. You just sort of taken the superficial part of it, bypassed the work. Yeah, put a neat little label on it, put it in a box, but continue. The underlying subconscious behaviors don't change, mm -hmm. or at least not not much and people and when they do change a bit often they ever get regressed during difficult times and i don't know it's i'm i'd be very very interested if oh, i hope never do it myself but in very very complex regression studies like of multivariance in all of these things to see if human beings actually can improve past a certain age and what is required what 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 is the difference between someone that never truly heals and someone that does there should be a statistical analysis that is double blind and completely sort of done around these things because we it's all run very anecdotally because it is a feely kind of mm -hmm. holistic thing as opposed to one that's run very scientifically but i feel like we are we've invented the wheel but we, we're still kind of making it octagonal in this kind <laughs> of like we haven't quite really experimented like and figured out the best way of doing this i think that it comes down to most likely precisely what you said earlier that there has to be a will to change a desire to change and that's really difficult to sort of pinpoint and work out the why and why they do um the the last part of the 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 letter is when seneca turns his focus to Achilles um and says well and how are you doing, mate? Um, and he quotes Epicurus about uh, <laughs> should live your life acting as though Epicurus was watching you. <laughs> so I don't know if that's exactly what Epi Epicurus said. It's, it was written as a, as a quote. He's like, I, Epicurus, am watching you live your life. <laughs> know that I'm watching you. In a Superman costume in the closet. In the closet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Seneca's into this Superman uh, costume in the closet. And he says, well, it's good at least to act as if someone is watching you. And we talked about this in a previous episode, this kind of imagined spectator that you can go, what would this look like to other people to try and help keep you on track? Depend and, and then you choose a good person that you, you would want to either emulate or impress in some way. Um, and Seneca thinks that's cool um, because he says, solitude prompts us to all kinds of evil. And I'm like, well... It can. Fuck you, buddy. Yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> the next note was, what does Dre think? Question mark. I was sort of an anticipating that. But I think that we find a solution in the next bit. Like, right. so I think it's one of those things that, just like when absolute power corrupts absolutely, like, no, power reveals who you are. Yeah. Solitude, I don't know if it reveals who you are or brings out the worst habits out, potentially. Like, it's not intrinsically bad or evil or anything like that. And to run away from it because a few philosophers seem to think that it's... Like, I got one t-shirt from my sister once as a present saying, uh, isolation is a breeding grounds for megalomania. Because apparently that it was like, this t-shirt, so you. <laughs> and you wore it proudly, no doubt. I did. Yep, there we go. <laughs> it was meant to shame you. I was like, nope. No shame. Nope, no no shame. You weren't going to be shamed into no, change. No, fuck that, no. Um, I was given a t-shirt once that said, Modafinil, breakfast of champions. I didn't really wear it. No? Well, it felt like it was just asking for conversations that I didn't need to have. Yeah, no, I guess. Also, everyone knows D-Ball is the breakfast of champions. What the, is that? It's the, it's the steroid used by the uh, bodybuilders in the 70s in America. Oh. It was the American answer to testosterone to try and compete against the Russians in the Olympics before test uh, steroids were banned. Oh. Num, num, num. It was created for the American athletes. Well, can we, should, should we still have it? Or is it like deeply flawed? No, it's one of the milder ones. And it's, I mean, 
it is, it's 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 potentially it would it would potentially still be used for example for burn victims or something like that to okay. avoid uh, tissue loss or muscle loss when they're in bed that kind of mm-hmm. thing it is a very effective uh, anabolic inducer um a friend of mine i've been noticing on facebook who uh has started getting training as a professional wrestler okay and he was already a very fit guy um did lots of sports and cycling and weights and so on and now he's looking you know like a legit wrestler in his tights and everything and he, he put up a, a picture going you know this is all comes down to hard work and training and commitment and all these things and he goes and steroids lots and <laughs> lots, lots of steroids, steroids. <laughs> <laughs> and i just loved the openness about it why not <laughs> like okay it all makes sense now <laughs> i hope to see some of his shows sometime um so on the solitude thing, an example that, that, that came to mind that, they, that plays out in fiction is in Doctor Who. Um, and there was this little sequence, I think it was two or three special episodes of when David Tennant was the Doctor. And for whatever reason, uh, he no longer has a companion that he travels with. And he changes. He chooses to really embrace the fact that he's a fucking Time Lord with incredible power to change time and space. And it doesn't go well. He kind of recognizes in himself and at some point says something like, this is why I can't travel alone. When he just becomes so like, well, I'm, I'm so frustrated at the things I can't change. And he's lost that kind of human connection with other people to be brought back to, doctor, what are you doing? Like, this is what's what's happening here where's the morality of what you're you're doing because with someone with that many powers it becomes so easy to slip into the well it's just a statistic if a million have to die for the purposes of the thing that needs to happen for the greater good and it's kind of zooming him back out of the of, of that such a macro perspective that individual lives don't matter right back down to individual lives are where you have to begin and build from if you want to have a working moral system I guess it depends what level he wants to operate at. Well, and he could choose. But he chooses in his character and why he was so different to many of the other Time Lords is that he's the renegade who does care about the, the individual. There's um, a line in the more recent series that I think I may have mentioned before uh, with Peter Capaldi as the Doctor talks about what is the true measure of civilization. It's not industry. It's not about... The, the usual ways that we we manage these things. It's, it's not about how many lives may have to be lost in the pursuit of the greater good. It's about the value that is put on the individual life, the unimportant life. That's how you measure something called civilization and its progress. Gives me the feels. <laughs> so anyway, from that point, Seneca kind of turns in a slightly different direction and... Um, and says, well, okay, so watch out for solitude. But the point is that once you've got yourself in order, you don't need this imagined watcher over your, your, your shoulder anymore that you refer to, like, am I doing the right thing? Robert Greene is behind me or whoever it is you've chosen. And he says, you are engaged in making of yourself the sort of person in whose company you would not dare to sin, which I read as like breaking your own moral code, that... The idea is to develop yourself in the context of other people and looking for mentors and examples and examples good and bad that you want to be like or not. Develop the code to the point where you don't need to imagine the responses of other people because it's already so integrated into your being that it is who you are. That's one way to go about it. Seems complex. Also, I think he's... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Seems complex, never mind. No, um, I don't know. Maybe just trust your instincts more. Perhaps. Well, I think that's kind of what it is about. Trusting your instincts. Mm. And knowing that there's a difference between saying trust your instincts versus like reacting out of momentary anger. Like that's your instinct. That's not the kind of instinct that I think no, it would I, mean. I mean instinct as in your drive to choose one choice over another Mm -hmm. as opposed to an emotional reaction around that or what to do about it the 
not the anger associated, for example, with someone coming at you with a knife, but the should I duck or should I punch him? Mm -hmm. And like, no, like instinct is that first drive. Was there a moral instinct too then? Because that's a survival instinct that you're giving an example of. Sure. Well, it's like with your coin example. You were trying to make a choice and you flipped a coin, not so much because the coin was going to choose, but to see what your reaction would be to the choice that was made for you. This is a great thing. If, If you struggle with making a decision, you're just really kind of lost with, I don't really know what I want. Take a coin, decide what heads or tails is going to mean, flip the coin, look at the result. And if your first thought is, oh, flip again, then you know actually what you want. But mm. it, it's amazingly effective. I hadn't done it for a while, but it was immediate and clear to me because you can get lost in all the intellectualizing and the arguments for and against. But some part of you does know what you want and does know what's important. And you can find it just in the simplicity of that moment of like, yeah, I'm not sure if I... And then it's clear. Hmm. The other thing I would do is avoid having one person in your imagination looking over you. It's a weird power. Unless it's me. No, and it's also like a kind of framework and philosophical... uh, You're essentially creating your own guardian angel slash god to watch over you, which is something you should avoid for your own... Um, correct mental functioning I think if you're going to go that way err on the side of caution and have more than one hey yeah have your privy council and treat them like annoying advisors that you'll probably disregard the advice of <laughs> like that you have to you have to be the king don't set up a system in your own mind where you're the servant of your morality morality yeah. is an advisor not your commander hmm I like another option, which is like, imagine, so if not a privy council, then the person looking over your shoulder is you in five years. Fuck you, future future me. (laughs) (laughs) Future future you who you hope will be the one who's developed in all sorts of ways that you would be proud to become and to look back and go, "Mm, you know, okay, buddy, I know where you were, but that wasn't the best choice or I'm proud of you for making the choice that led me to be mm. this version of myself now. The Going to back to Doctor Who, his biggest enemy kills himself from the future. <laughs> Precisely in a, in a real world version of this. <laughs> <laughs> I will not become this thing that I don't want to be. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'd, our lives don't have to become that complex. Um, Seneca says that if we get to the point where we don't need the Epicurus looking over our shoulder, then he he says we can do this other Epicurean suggestion. The time when you should most of all withdraw into yourself is when you were forced to be in a crowd. Seneca says, yes, provided that you are a good, tranquil and self-restrained man. Otherwise, you had better withdraw into a crowd in order to get away from yourself. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that was one of the points that I thought. That's funny. Basically saying most people should be afraid of being by themselves. (laughs) (laughs) If you haven't found your own center and your own compass and can be okay with yourself calmly, then it's probably better that you do spend time with other people to help you continue calibrating and learning who you are. And like all calibration, that means through interactions with other forces and in this case other people even for well-balanced people i count myself as one of the kinds of people that can be by himself for extended periods of time um i've personally discovered that i think we're just input machines input output machines in the absence of other people um our input drops to nearly zero and therefore our output becomes very boring and dull and our own thinking and our own Mm -hmm. capacity to be anything other than whatever it is like we we seem diminished unfortunately your beautiful soul and beautiful uh, personality and what you have to offer the world seems to be sort of a ripple of a mirror of kind of reflections of everything else that's happening around Mm -hmm. you so surrounding yourself with people creates sort of this echo and resonance that allows patterns to emerge you by yourself generate very little I think like a kind of more mundane example of that is whilst it might be really good to go to uh, the float tank, the isolation tank, 
now and then and help just sort of calm everything in yourself if you're just doing that like six eight hours every day you're just this kind of sludgy mess and all you can do is like yeah man i'm just totally great blah, blah, blah. you're just you're nothing you're just a mess because you're not using that experience to help you be and express yourself in the world you're just continuing to eat the chocolate cake nom 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 end <laughs> i was just thinking of the the quote that in uh, rick and morty is that jerry says I, I, I always miss I always misquote this I think it says life is a struggle and I'll stop when I die <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I guess I guess that may be true I want to find another Rick and Morty quote what, uh, before we sign off so you can fill this fill this gap now oh with. yes <laughs> I don't know I don't know what with <laughs> well um, oh uh, if you've been enjoying these letters uh please get in touch we'd love to know if there's anything that piqued your interest uh, oh, i'm sure we look at the camera if there's people on youtube watching hello um let us know let, let us know if there's anything you want to ask us about them or if you thought we were wrong on anything um this is not about us telling you what to think or being certain of what we're saying is correct mm. we're thinking out I, i was trying to express this to one of the haters today we are thinking out loud And input, once again, input from others is especially useful and will make me better until I become even better and, <laughs> and take over the world. So please help me do that. 100%. That's what it is. This is, this is thinking out loud. If you, if you read or have heard the description of what we said we were trying to do with this series is we are learning as we go along. And in the process of our learning and talking about it, hopefully being able to help other people join us on that journey. And of course, we want to hear from you and what you think about it. And these are just our interpretations and struggles to live the good life, as these philosophers would talk about it. And I don't think that we're hiding from the fact that, you know, we're like, oh, I don't know about this. I fuck up at this. I'm not sure about that. So there's been times where I've changed my opinion between podcast, between episodes, mm -hmm. you know, like it's meant to be fluid. Thinking, opinions, there's no truth. In the words of the Assassin's Creed, there is no truth. There is no truth. Here's the Rick and Morty quote that I'm going to slightly adulterate. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's going to die. Come listen to our podcast. Nice. <laughs> so please do next week. And in the meantime, be silly, be kind and be weird. <laughs>